Hello, Encountering Ministries and everybody watching and tuning in. Uh, glad to have you. You can see our uh, intro video here has a guest with us. Uh, this, this guest also happens to be one of our singers. This is Shannon, and uh, we're going to have a little bit of a different worship set today that you'll see. Uh, so again, welcome everybody. And we want to talk a little bit about what the, the message is going to be. And I'm talking about uh, the silly knucklehead things I've done growing up that have taught me some good lessons. And uh, we're in this middle of this series, and right about now, I'm surprised they haven't uh, haven't fired me, considering the fact that I have done so many ingenious things um, growing up that didn't turn out the way I had hoped and didn't end up being as brilliant as I thought those ideas were, were at one time. But uh, this week, and I'm not going to give you what happened, you'll see, you'll find out in the sermon, um, but it's about the experience of, of drowning. And... I, I brought in Shannon and I asked her, I said, Shannon, have you ever had an episode where you felt like you were drowning? And she gave me two different answers, and I think they really make the point. So, Shannon, I'm going to ask you first, tell us about when physically you felt like you were drowning. Go ahead. Um, so, everybody that knows me knows I have a huge family of cousins. And we were all swimming when I was younger in a pool, and somebody flipped over the tube I was on, and I got stuck underneath it. Somebody else jumped on top, and I was could not breathe, drinking water, and my cousin reached down and pulled me up, yeah. saved me. Did you have that feeling where you were like gasping for yes, air? Yeah, absolutely. And you're like, I don't know how much longer I can hold on yeah, before somebody scary. finally, yeah. Right, that feeling that we get where we're like gasping for air, um, and, we, and we feel like we're drowning, that's, that, that's something that people use also to talk about emotionally and spiritually, that feeling like you're drowning. Like you can't breathe and you're just gasping for air. And so when I asked Shannon about uh, about an experience that she might have had drowning, she said the one she just told us, but she also gave us one um, emotionally that I think sets the tone for the message this week. So tell us about that. <laughs> I spent nine years in a very physically and mentally abusive relationship where at the end I was yeah. drowning. Yeah. Yeah, right. Absolutely, and, and it feels like you can't breathe. I right emotionally. Yes. Yeah. Couldn't breathe. Couldn't breathe. Yeah. And so today, as we get ready um, this week um, to think about Jesus as the one who saves the, the hand that reaches and pulls us out, um, I I want you to maybe just reflect on some times that you maybe felt like you were drowning. It could be physically. It could be spiritually. It could be. Uh, emotionally, could be mentally. Um, and I, I wonder if Jesus didn't do something in your life to grab hold of you and pull you out and give you the breath that you need to make life make sense again, to make life fall. And, you know, when you think about the relationship piece of it, Shannon, you know, unlike the physical drowning, which as soon as you catch your breath, you may be shaken up. You may even have a, a fear of water going down the road uh, in your life. But when you come out emotionally um, from that place of feeling like you're drowning, a lot of times you don't feel like life is safe. If you've had something that's dominated your life for nine years or however long it is, it's hard to trust again. And it's hard to feel like things are safe again. And when Jesus brings us up on dry land, um, he doesn't just heal us from the moment. He heals us from the experience. And so that's my thought for this week. So uh, get ready, everybody. We're about to worship, and we'll talk to you soon. Welcome, Encountering Ministries and friends and family and everybody tuning in. So glad to have you. We have just Shannon and I today doing a scaled-down worship set uh, that we hope is equally as meaningful for you and that your spirit is able to just let go with God and really connect today. I think that's our goal when we talked even about uh, doing an acoustic set Shannon actually mentioned it what, a couple weeks ago. And just yeah. having a time to really bond with God and strip away a lot of the, um, the frills. And so that's our hope. That's going to be how we open this first song. We're going to also do the, the order maybe a little bit different. Just one song in the beginning. Uh, it's meant to just set the tone, okay, and get us. Use this song. Use it uh, so your heart gets in a place where it's ready to receive the word today. And then the two songs afterwards are kind of reflective songs that have to do with the message. And I'm hoping that those last two songs God will use to take you on a journey as you worship, take you into a place of repair, a uh, place of, of prayer, 
uh, maybe a place of repentance. I don't know. I don't know where God will lead you. I don't know where he'll lead me in it. But let's have a powerful moment uh, with God in worship today. This is So Will I. For the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of light And as you speak Your breath, the planets form. The stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you made. Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. Sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. Spoken on nature and science, follow the sound of your voice as you speak. A hundred billion creatures catch their breath, evolving in pursuit of what you said. Now reveals your nature, so will I. And see your heart, everything you say. The pain and sky, canvas of your grace. Creation still obeys you, so will I. So will I, so will I. 
put you in a place to receive the word that you hear God speak, just like we sang. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Let's get ready to receive the word, everybody. We'll see you back here for worship afterwards. God bless. So we're in this series of the ingenious ideas that I had as a kid that seemed to get me in trouble, right? And if you listen to the opening video, um, you know that we're talking in some ways about water and uh, that feeling like you're drowning. And the series that preceded this series was also about a river, but it was about the river of life. It was about the river that Jesus says is the Holy Spirit that um, flows out of our heart, he says in John 7. And in John 4, he says that this living water, this living river is welling up inside of us and, and producing a spring of eternal life. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's all different kinds of rivers, right? There's the Connecticut River, right, which is right almost in my backyard, um, not on the water, but close to it, right? And then there's the Naugatuck River, where most of the experiences that I've been telling you about happened. Um, there's all different types of rivers, and I think it's important that when we step out in faith with God, when we want to walk on the water with Jesus, that we know that we're on the river of life that holds us up and not on the river of deceit, okay? And there's a group from my childhood, from my young days, called Allison Chains. It was a singer, Lane Staley. And Lane's had a song, he was with this, this kind of band Mad Season that had some members from Pearl Jams and members from Alice in Chains. They 
brought together. And he had this song, River of Deceit. And you could really see it was about his, um, his struggle with addiction, which eventually took his life. And Lane had a way of putting into lyrics almost like a, a warning to people about the dangers of addiction. And he was just singing from his heart. And he was, again, it's the, the title's called The River of Deceit. And he says, my pain is self-chosen. And then some of the other lyrics say, I, I could either drown or pull off my skin and swim to shore. And you see that idea, like pull off my skin. I got to become somebody new. I got to shed this outer shell, all right, in order to be able to swim again. I could cut off my pride and buy some time. A head full of lies is a weight that's tied to my waist. And then he sings, the river of deceit pulls down, right? The only direction we flow is down. And so I think it's really kind of, um, in some ways, this message is, is taking the, the whole river series about the river of life and the whole mistakes I made by the river, right? <laughs> the actual rivers. And kind of driving this point of you have to know when you're stepping out with Jesus and you're looking to walk on water with Jesus, you've got to know what water you're standing on. You've got to know what river you're basking in. You've got to know what river is propping you up. Is it the river of life or is it the river of deceit? And I use this, this quote from Lane Staley in my book, Imperfectly Perfect, talking about the river of deceit, where we, where we think we're swimming, we think we're basking in a river of life, but really, it's not the river of life. As a matter of fact, Scripture says you know, that, that the devil comes like an angel of light. He comes in a way that's appealing to us, and then we realize, oh, this isn't the river we thought it was, and we're drowning here, right? Psalm 38.4 says, for my iniquities are gone over my head. In the King James, it says that they're, they're making me drown, right? My iniquities are causing me to drown, but they've gone over my head as a heavy burden. They weigh too much for me. And I think about those lyrics to the river of deceit, right? A head full of lies is a weight tied to my waist. The river of deceit pulls down. I hear this guy struggling with, with addictions, struggling not being able to get out. I hear him, my pain is self-chosen, right? And then I hear this scripture, my iniquities are gone over my head. I'm drowning in them as a heavy burden. They weigh too much for me. And sometimes we find ourselves that our burdens, sometimes we find ourselves that our iniquities, our sins, they are pulling us down in a river of deceit. And so my life lesson for today, all right, is, is kind of fun. I don't know if you remember the, the shopping pl uh, store called Ames, all right? Ames, there was like Caldors and Ames, and they, those were big back in the day. They're like the, the Walmarts and Targets of today, but back then it was Ames and Caldor, all right? And anyone who remembers those, hopefully you can have a good laugh at that. Well, there was um, right across the river. So here's, here was our house growing up, right? And then there was the river. And right across the river was Ames. And I used to like to go buy cassette tapes of my favorite bands, right? And uh, this, but obviously, if you, if you were driving, you'd go way down the other, the other end of Ansonia, cross over the bridge, and come way back up to Ames. And, you know, too far to ride our bikes, so it was also winter, and nobody really likes to go that far on a bike ride in the winter. Um, but I had this brilliant idea that the river was frozen, and we should walk across the river to get to Ames. Now, I'm going to admit something here, all right? The brilliant idea I had was in part... Um, festering in me and, and causing me to want to try to be a daredevil because there was a, a, a young lady there, we're in eighth grade now, who I had a little bit of a crush on, okay? And so I was going to pull the big stunt, right? We were going to walk across the ice. I was going to be the daredevil. I was going to impress this person. And I remember when we got there, she looked at me and she said, it was me and a friend of mine and her, and she looked at me and she said, you, you can't cross that because it was thin. I mean, it was starting to warm up, and there was some slush on the top of the ice, all right, and some areas where you could see the water underneath. It was that thin. But I now had been challenged by the object of my crush. I was challenged by the one I was trying to impress. Our pain is self-chosen sometimes, 
right? Like the song says. And when I heard that, I became all the more inspired to walk out on the ice. Now, the other two were having none of it, right? They're off to the side. I remember the girl, she just put one foot where the ice was, one or two feet where the ice was still strong. But as I got towards the middle of the river, all right, it was, I mean, just slush at the top, and I could see right through the ice, and I could see water bubbling on top of the ice, and I knew it was thin, but again, I had in my mind, you can't do that. You can't do that, and I had, I had someone I wanted to impress, so I took a step into where it was real thin, and this whole area that was thin, and boom, it just let go, and I was underwater, Okay? And here's the crazy part of this, right? Somehow, my hands flew up in the air and latched the sides of the hole that I just fell through. I mean, I don't think I could have that fast reflexes again if, if I tried. It was like, and I was under the water holding on with the tips of my fingers, all right? And I was able, and I can't even figure out how this happened, and I want to talk about this more in the beginning, in a little bit rather. I was able to pull myself up onto this cracked now, broken, even more susceptible to cracking because I'd started this whole hole in it, right? Ice, waterlogged from head to toe. I mean, I got away 25, 30 pounds more than I did before on ice that's now cracked and broken, okay? And I had those winter jackets on. You know, they're not like the winter jackets we have today that you buy that have the nice Arctic fleece with maybe a nice um, wind sh windbreaking shell over it, and they're only that, that thick, you know? It was back in the, you know, the 80s where you had the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man look on your winter jacket, and you just walked around like this, okay? And it's waterlogged. And I pull myself back up. No, no fighting, no scrapping, just got, next thing I know, I'm, I'm on the land again. And I'm petrified. I mean, I had to do that walk of shame back, and I couldn't even look at the girl. She, she must have thought I was just an absolute knucklehead, right? Um, luckily, we were, we were also good friends. And, and so I'm walking, and I remember there was little pieces of ice that I was shaking out of my coat, and I was shivering on the whole walk home. And all I could think of is, man, if my parents see me walk in soaking wet, they're going to be like, what happened? What happened? And I did my best to get in the house unseen. Of course, they wanted to know why the, the jacket was soaking wet, right? And I remember my parents being so like, <gasps> like their breath taken away that that happened. Um, but if we think about it, there is a real life lesson in here. Are you trying to walk on water? Or are you walking on thin ice? Because sometimes we think we're walking on water in life. Sometimes we think we're on the top of it. And really, we are setting ourselves up where if we take another step, we're going to start sinking and we're going to start drowning, right? And, and then we have to deal with that and we have to, we have to recognize that sometimes our pain, right, while, while I do believe that sometimes we get into situations and we don't know how to get out of them and sometimes they, they own us and... and, and things get beyond our control. I do resonate with what Lane Staley said that sometimes our pain is self-chosen. But here's the thing, right? Here's the thing that I think is so important for today. The thing that's going to, I think, has led me to the scripture that I want to come to in a minute. Um, I don't know how it happened that I latched my hands on. And I think in some ways that was a miracle, Okay. I think it was also quite miraculous that I could then pull myself up waterlogged onto ice that's now cracked and broken that's, I mean, just razor thin and make it to shore. But more than those two things, the thing that really set in my mind that I haven't forgotten, I got out of the water like that. Now, I know some people can say that's adrenaline. Right? That's adrenaline. As soon as you went under and latched off, you were able to pull yourself up. But I, I swear to you, it was like a hand reached in and yanked me out. I mean, I was down and up like that. I caught myself, all right, and by, the, by just the tips, how I was able to pull up from the tips immediately. It was like I was shot out of the air or shot out of the water, right? I, 
I couldn't do a pull-up water log like that, freezing and all that. And I know some people will, will say, oh, that's adrenaline, that's adrenaline. You could do amazing things when, you're, when, when you have this adrenaline. But, I mean, it was like an instant. There was no fight. There was no scrapping at the ice trying to claw my way up. It was like, boom, and I was up on the top, all right? I, I think if, if I was to think about this, you know, scientifically even, I would think somehow my hands would be up and I'd be clawing. I'd be clawing and I'd be slipping through the ice trying to make my way up. But I just remember being shot back up. All right, I blinked and it was like a hand had grabbed mine and yanked. And I think in life, we tread a lot on some very thin ice and we think we're walking on water. We think we're on top. But we're walking on thin ice where in just a few steps we are going to be drowning in the river of deceit. And sometimes it's pride, like, like me, right? It was pride that takes us to the river of deceit. Sometimes it's try to impress others. Do people like me? I want to be liked. I want people to think I'm, I'm cool. I want people to think I'm hip, I'm hip, whatever it might be. Sometimes it's love of material things. I don't know what Ames had that was so important, but I promise you there's nothing that Target or Walmart has that would cause me to ever want to do that today. Sometimes it's the love of material things. Sometimes it's loneliness. Sometimes there's all these things that cause us to, to want to try to get up, pull ourselves, and walk on water, but really we're heading down a path that's very, very thin ice. And there are a lot of things that catch and distract our eyes and lead us onto the ice in some very deep waters. Again, the message for today, sometimes we think we're walking on water, but we're just walking on thin ice. We think we're on the water of life, but we're drowning in the river of deceit. We think we're the man. We think we're on top of the world until the bottom gives out and you realize you're drowning. And we need to find out the key to figure out how do we actually know that, that times that we're walking on water and we're on the right path and we're not one step away from drowning. How do we figure that out? And that's going to lead me, lead me to a, a scripture, <coughs> which some of you may can, can probably a picture in your mind for those of you who know the scriptures well of what scripture I might turn to here about being drowning underwater and having a hand come and pull you out, all right? Because Peter, he wants to walk on water. Peter wants to be the man with Jesus, right? Peter wants to say, Lord, I see you out there. I want to come too. And there's reasons. I don't think that desire is bad. We're going to learn here in a minute. I think that desire has everything to do with being a follower of Jesus, you want to walk on the water with him. But look at the way this happens. Let's go to Matthew 14, chap uh, chapter 14, verse 22 and forward. Immediately, he, meaning Jesus, made the disciples get into a boat. He had just done some, some stuff with the crowds, right? And he, he was teaching them, and obviously there's miracles happening. Everybody's, you know, they're fired up. And he, he says immediately to the disciples, get into the boat and go ahead of them on the other side while he sent the crowds away. Now, after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Meaning the wind was opposite of the way that the boat was trying to go. And they're just getting hammered. They're just getting battered, right? And the first question we may want to ask from this text is, why did Jesus send them away from his presence to a place where they were going to be caught in the waves and the wind. Right? And sometimes God asks us to go to places that aren't the most comfortable for us, the places where storms happen. you got to believe, and we've been talking about this lately, he's leading you to that storm. He's sending you that because he wants to do a miracle in your life. He wants to take you from one place to another. He wants to see you rise up. He may even want to teach you to walk on water. And so we look, and it says, and in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And that's the thing, right? It's in the storms of life that we see Jesus, right? Everybody who's, who's been in a real struggle, who's had kind of a conversion in their heart or something. I, I was, you know, researching this sermon. I was reading testimonies about people who were at their wit's end. They were tied up in brothels, and they were tied up in gangs, and they were tied up in drugs, and they were tied up in all these different things. And how Jesus just took them and, and brought healing to their life. And it's in those storms we get a glimpse of who Jesus really is is walking on the water towards us, right? And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear, right? And that's the devil's trick. 
That's the devil's trick. God has put you in a place to find redemption. God has put you in a place right, to see a miracle in your life. God has led you even to a storm so he can deliver you from the fear associated with it. But the devil wants you to only see the storm. He doesn't want you to see Jesus walking on the water. He wants you to see the storm that surrounds Jesus, all right? He wants you to see the storm that surrounds you and take your eyes and your vision away, right? And Jesus immediately, he spoke to them and he said, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Take courage, take heart, right? Don't have fear. Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, most disciples would be like, woo, Jesus is here. It's not a ghost. Jesus is here. We're going to be okay. But Peter wants to go the extra mile. Peter doesn't just want to be delivered from the waves. He wants to walk on the storm. He wants to walk on the wave. He wants to conquer the storms of life. And there's a really great metaphor in that right there. Peter doesn't just want to survive the storms. He wants to conquer the storms. Man, I'm telling you there's a message and for somebody here. There's a message right now for somebody on that where you don't want to just survive the storm. You want to conquer the storm. You don't want to be just delivered, right, from an, ex from an experience or from a moment. You want to be healed from the whole experience. You don't want to just be delivered in a moment but healed from the whole experience in your life. He wants to conquer his fears. He wants to conquer the storms. And so he says, call me out. And if you know anything about the disciple relationship to a rabbi, to a teacher, like Peter would have had with Jesus, um, a disciple, and there's been people who have talked about this before, this is nothing new, right? The goal of a disciple was to be like their rabbi, be like their teacher. They wanted to do whatever their teacher did. That meant that they were working their way up as a disciple. And so it's very natural for a disciple who has faith and confidence in their teacher to say, I got to do what you're doing. I got to be able to conquer the storms of life too. That is a good intention on Peter's part. That's a good desire on Peter's part. But he goes wrong somewhere, right? Jesus says, come. And Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came toward Jesus, right? He came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and, began to, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Where does Peter go wrong? He goes wrong in the same place that we all go wrong. He took his eyes off of Jesus. Seeing the wind, there's a reason that that's highlighted in the text, right? He's looking at Jesus. He's saying, send me out to you, right? Help me conquer these storms. Jesus is saying, come on, if you've got faith, I got you. You're not just going to survive. You're going to conquer. Come on. And as soon as he takes his eyes off Jesus and looks at the storm of life, he starts to sink. And brothers and sisters, that is what the devil wants for your life, for you to take your eyes off Jesus so that you're drowning that's his goal. Take your eyes off of Jesus. Right, they're in the boat. They don't see Jesus. They're afraid. As soon as Jesus comes, the minute they take their eyes off of him, they're afraid. That is so true to how life can be in the Christian walk, right? We, we've had these experiences with Jesus, but then all of a sudden we're, we feel alone again on a boat. We don't feel him right next to us. We assume he's gone. The storms of life start kicking in. All of a sudden we, see, we feel Jesus again. We start to see his work again. We get excited. We start venturing out. And then all of a sudden the devil puts something in our mind. They put aims on the other side of the river or they put a pretty girl next to us right and all of a sudden our eyes drift off Jesus and down we go you see when Jesus says come right? and there's a point to be made there's somebody I think has to hear this point that really needs it because I think it's really central to the message that God put on my heart when Jesus says come he's also saying leave the place you were let me say that again. When Jesus says, come to me, he's at the same time saying, leave the place that you've been. Just let that sink in for a minute. He's saying both of those things. And a lot of times we hear the words, come to me, but we don't hear the words, leave the boat. Leave the place that you've been hanging out in. Leave the place that's been keeping you afraid, that's been tying a, a shackle to you waiting for you to drown. We have to hear both, right? 
Leave the boat of unrighteousness. Leave the boat of fear. Leave the boat of sin. Leave the boat of doubt. Leave that place that you wanted to impress people. Leave that ship that has you trapped in sin and doubt. Leave the life raft that you've been using to try to, 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 try to navigate the storms of life just holding on in fear. Leave those because you can step out in faith and you can not only survive them, you can conquer them, you can overcome, you can have victory over the storms of life. But you got to keep your eyes focused on him and you got to have faith to step out and make sure that the water that you're walking on is held up by the river of life and not the river of deceit because as soon as you take your eyes off of Jesus that river will turn into the river of deceit real fast you'll be looking at Ames you'll be thinking about the new uh, cassette tape you got tears for fears or whatever 80s band you want to plug in there see Jesus he calls us from something so that he can call us to something. When Jesus calls us to himself, he's calling us also to something miraculous, to something that he wants to do in your life so that you're walking on water and not drowning in the river. Let that soak in for a minute. When Jesus calls us from a place and calls us to himself, he's calling us to do something in our life that is miraculous. Come to the place where you'll be standing on top of the storm because that's where I am. But the minute we take and we look at the wind, we take our eyes off, oh, the river of deceit pulls down, right? Right? You sink when you take your eyes off of them, right? Jesus is trying to teach us something. Look, he says, you know, all right, we know that sin and we know that struggle and we know that brokenness and all the things that come from sin have distorted our eyes and distorted our vision of God. And so Jesus comes and he says, look, as you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You see my love for you. You see my Father's love for you. You see what I can do in your life. You see what God can do in your life. So if the way we see God again is through him, we got to be sure we're not taking our eyes off of him. We got to be sure we know what water we're walking on. Is it the river of life or is it the thin ice that's going to trap us down? Right? Pick up in verse 31. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are certainly God's son, right? The hand of God rescues us when we're drowning. Our pain is sometimes self-chosen, yes. Our struggle sometimes is the result of our own footsteps toward the thin ice, I, but Jesus is always faithful to take the hand and pull us back up. But we have to remember, he's not just trying to save us from that moment. He's trying to save us from future moments of thin ice. Because it seems like time and time again, we journey back to the same river of deceit that we were in before. We journey right back to the place of salvation that we were supposed to be delivered from. You see it in, in, with Israel in the Old Testament. As soon as they leave Egypt, as soon as they leave slavery, storms start coming up, right? They're thirsty. <coughs> First thing they want to do is go back. We head back. We just, we just walk the Red Sea, and we want to go back up to where it swallowed Egypt whole, the Egyptians up. What, what a metaphor for life is in this, right? The hand of God rescues us when we lose faith, rescues us when we doubt, rescues us when we take our eyes off Jesus. Why? Because you were not meant to fall in the ice. You were meant to walk on water with him. And the devil wants to confuse you. He wants to drown you with doubts. He wants you to turn back to chaos, turn back to doubt, turn back to sin. And Jesus, time and time again, leaves the 99 sheep that are safe to go rescue the one. And I, can't, I think about this, again, from my own life lesson, from my own experience. It was like a hand just ripped me out of that water, set me back on something that should have never held me up, and got me back to the place. But spirit, that happened physically, but spiritually, I returned to thin ice in my life many times. 
And yes, Jesus' hand was faithful to pull me out time and time and time again. But the question for today is, why when he lifts us up, why do we go back to the thin ice rather than walk on the river of life? Why? What is in it? What is aims all that, all that appealing to us? No, I didn't actually go try to walk on the ice again to Ames. But figuratively, too many of us head back. We take advantage of God's grace, and maybe, you know, maybe it's because we think, yeah, you know, I've been in this situation before. Jesus is going to rip me out again, so why not take another shot at it? But is that really what our destiny in him is? Is that really the way you want to spend life? Continually drowning and being pulled up? And I'm not saying Jesus isn't faithful to come and lift us up on more than one occasion. I'm not saying Jesus' arm is tired. What I'm saying is, are we taking advantage of grace? Yeah. You know, a kid, if you ever watch a kid when there's a pool and they run towards the pool and they see their mom or their dad get excited and run towards the edge and scoop them up and say, no, 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 no. What's the, what's the, if the kid's real little, what do they do again, right? They look with a smile and they run back towards the edge of the pool and mom or dad go, no, 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 no. It becomes a game. Listen, we aren't here to play games with Jesus. He doesn't say, come on and walk on the water with me. He doesn't say that for us to play games with him. We got to grow in our faith. We can't stay like a young one who continually walks to the edge just to feel the parents scoop him up. That's not, why, that's not why God revealed himself to us. That's not why God called us. That's not why he draws, draws us. And that's certainly not why he says, Peter, come on, I'm going to teach you to conquer the storms, not just survive them. Walking on water with Jesus isn't about playing games. It's about being empowered to change the world. It's about being empowered to sow the gospel. It's about being empowered to, to thrive in grace and not play games with grace and not take advantage of grace. It's to bring the kingdom of God into people's lives. Why do we waste time when God has such amazing other things that are planned for us? I want to know my potential in Christ. I don't want to just know that he's going to pull me out every time I sink. I want to see my potential. It's like I talked about last week. It's not just who you are. It's who you're becoming. Who's he growing us to? And I don't believe that God's, what he started in us. And it says in scripture that he who began a good work and you will see it to completion. It doesn't say he who began a good work is just going to play games with you in the ice all your life. He's saying he who began this in you is going to grow you and see you and bring you to a place where you aren't walking on thin ice anymore. You're on the water. You're on the water surviving and thriving, victor, victorious and conquering. Changing the world with the gospel. Jesus says, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I don't think drowning and being pulled up and drowning and being pulled up and drowning. and That's not what Jesus means when he says to give you life abundantly. It's not a roller coaster ride in Christianity up and down and up and down and up and down. We may jump on that roller coaster and feel like it's up and down. But he has called you to walk on water not drown in the ice. Do we want our life to be different because it's there for us? And once God changes that, I mean, once, once he pulls you up and he sits you down and he says, listen, you aren't meant for that river of deceit. You're meant for that river of life. You're not meant to drown in the Naugatuck over and over again. You're meant to tread and rise and walk to be my hands and feet in the world. And once that happens, I'm telling you, you will conquer your fear. You will learn to walk on water. You will learn to not fear the storms or the sea. And that's what Peter figures out in the end. I got one more scripture to close with. And I want you to see the contrast. Once you've really experienced salvation and you're done playing games, John 21, 7. 
Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, right, they're out fishing. Right? They're out fishing, and Jesus has you know, been crucified. Right? Jesus is, you know, they're, they're wondering, like, when's he going to show up again? Right? When are we going to see him again? And I got I to gotta wonder if in Peter's head he doesn't remember, you know, I remember a time being out on a boat when Jesus wasn't there. And I remember being afraid and I remember drowning because I took my eyes off of him. I wonder if Peter isn't saying, when he shows up again, I'm locking on him. And I'm not going to be afraid. And so they're out on this boat and Again, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, look, it's the Lord, right? And the Lord is on the bank, right? The Lord is, is, on, is on the bank. You, you, know, he isn't, you, don't, you don't read that he's out walking on the water again. But Peter remembers the lesson. He remembers the lesson better than I remembered the lesson. It is the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. When you really understand grace and you really understand salvation and you really understand that hand pulled you out of the water, not just to get you dry for a short time so that you could jump back in. When you really understand grace and its empowerment in your life, its ability to change you, its ability to empower and equip you to be a voice for God that's going to help grow others, heal others, teach others to walk on water. When you realize that, you won't take your eyes off Jesus. And that place that used to be so fearful, you'll throw yourself right in as long as you're looking at him. I'll jump right into that sea. I'll jump right into that river. Because if I'm looking at him, and I'm going towards him. I'm going to walk on it. I'm not going to sink and I'm not going to drown. When you know the one who enables you is here, you'll cast the fears aside. So my real question to leave us for today, who wants to spend their life sinking in the thin ice of the river of deceit over and over and over again when you can walk on the river of life with Jesus. I want to take a little time and just say a, a prayer of, of repentance. I feel like maybe that if, I, I really feel like this message is for somebody who's listening, who's found themselves tripped up in the, the river of deceit too much and finally feels the call not just to be saved over and over again from that river of deceit, but feels the call to switch rivers, start walking on the river of life. And so you know, that requires a turning away. That requires saying, I'm on dry land and I'm not going back. And so I'm going to lead us just in a prayer of repentance. And I, if you've got things in your life, and, and I said it in the opening intro when Shannon and I were talking, you know, God doesn't just heal you from the moment. He heals you from an experience. He heals you from a, a lifestyle. He heals you from a, from a lifestyle that's, that's filled with doubt and, and filled with fear and filled with, you know, um, with, with sin sometimes, right? I mean, let's be honest, right? It might be greed. It might be addiction. It might be anything, you know. It might be something that's just got out of control in your life and you, can't, you don't even have control over it anymore. And so I believe that this, this time right now is meant to be healing for somebody. And so uh, I'm going to lead us in a, in a little time of prayer, and then we'll go back to worship. And as I said in the beginning, the last two songs are very much meant to go together, right? Find me in the river. Find me on my knees. And then the song, Blameless, you know, Blameless, you call me worthy. Right? You pronounced me clean. And so something about that kneeling at that river on your knees for a little bit. Something about that enables you to have the confidence to walk on that river with him. So let's pray. God, if there's somebody watching this who's tired of the deceit, tired of the struggle, 
tired of getting to that point where they're drowning and they're saying, Lord, save me. I'm drowning again. God, I pray that they hit their knees on the riverbank. I, hit, I pray, Lord God, that they hit their knees right now wherever they are and they just go to you and say, Lord, I confess that I have, I have led myself to pain that has been self-chosen and the river is pulling me down. And oh, like the song goes, if I could just shed this skin and get to shore. I know you got better rivers for me to, to navigate, better rivers that you want to teach me to walk on. And Lord, I confess personally, I know that there's things in my life I have to turn from. And I offer this prayer for myself and for everybody listening that we would feel the call to the river of righteousness, that we would leave sin behind, that we would leave doubt behind, that we would leave unbelief behind, and that we would remember that when you call us to yourself, you're also calling us from the boat that's in the storm. And you're calling us from it because you're calling us to something special, to something miraculous to something that leaves us when we're standing there next to you on top of the water, leaves us thinking, I feel like my master right now. I'm not just holding a hand up, drowning underwater, waiting for you to yank me out. I'm up here with you and I'm holding your hand alongside of you. Lord, whoever this message is meant for, I pray that it's a life-changing moment from your word and not mine. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Everybody, we're going to go back to worship now. Like I said, these two songs are meant to go together, and I, I pray that you will have a moment with God in them, that you will reflect, that you will, if you need to hit your knees, hit your knees. If you need to call out to them, call out to them. But make sure at the end, when we're singing blameless, that you stand and you recognize there's no ice below you that's about to drop. We'll see you in just a bit. Welcome back again, everyone, to our closing worship set. Like I said, we're going to join two songs together. Um, and just like the first song before the message was meant to set your heart right, these, these two collaborations, actually there's a, a kind of a third song that's thrown in at the end, but we won't give that away. Um, they're meant to take us on a walk of reflection and... Maybe even some repentance, you know, and, and it's okay to do that. I, I think sometimes we're scared of that word, but that's a very liberating word. It's not a restrictive word. Um, it's something that opens us up. And so be in prayer as you worship. Um, and yes, you can sing and pray and worship and reflect all at the same time. So this one's uh, Find Me in the River. And then we'll go right into Blame Us. <laughs> Find me in the river Find me on my knees I've walked against the water and I'm waiting with a place Long to see the roses
yourself in the river. Lord Jesus, you are faithful to save us. That when our hearts are open to you, and we have hearts that are repentant and not afraid to come before you and ask for forgiveness. Help us to never forget but your answer is that we're blameless. And though our sins be as scarlet, surely you have made them white as snow.
God bless you, everybody. Tune in again next week. Uh, we hope that you felt the spirit of God move, and thank you for joining us. We'll see you. All right, everyone, our final piece for today's service is the devotional piece. Uh, we talked about Jesus saving us. We talked about um, how sometimes our, our choices and our decisions and the things that we get involved in um, lead us to a place where we're, we're drowning. And, you know, we made the point in the intro video, as well as the sermon, um, that Jesus doesn't just heal us from the moment. He, he heals us in a way that empowers us going forward. And so if you're going to share in your small group or in whatever community that you're watching this in, where you're going to process this through, to, through together, uh, give some stories of testimony. That's, that's the first thing. Um, how has God rescued you from life, from the, the dangerous waters of life? <clears throat> how has he grabbed your hand and, and lifted you up? Um, but then I, I also think it might be important to, to talk about how he empowered you and healed you from not only the moment, but from the experience but as soon as I say that, I also think um, maybe there's some people out there who are still wrestling with the experience, even though Jesus saved them from the moment. But the experience they haven't let go of yet. And so they still feel sometimes and feel this trigger like they're drowning, even though they're out of the situation. And so, you know, that's something that Jesus can heal us of too. That's something that we have to give to him. And I think we have to be willing to take a risk and be willing to hit our knees and say, Jesus, there's still some healing in these areas left to do. And so um, I think that's a, a point for devotional life uh, to give to God in prayer and to talk about or maybe process with your small groups. And I hope it produces great fruit and that it does something where moments like these can be actually life changing. So we will see you next week, everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in. It's a blessing and an honor to do it. If you can support our ministry, we're really grateful for it. You can find information on the website uh, and please uh, pray for our ministry, pray for its growth um, and its expansion. Uh, we're excited and thrilled and honored to be doing it. God bless.